Good evening, everyone. Before we begin, we're just going to start with a land acknowledgement. Niagara Region is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The Regional Municipality of Niagara stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. Thanks so much for joining us for our town hall for parents and guardians of kids aged six months to five years old. I'm Lisa and I'm with the Clinical Services Division. I'll be moderating during the Q&A with Drs. Hergy and Kazmani. Dr. Hergy is Niagara's Acting Medical Officer of Health and Dr. Kazmani is one of, the, of Niagara's Associate Medical Officers of Health. We'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Please type any questions you have in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna try and get to as many questions as possible this evening, but just in case we don't, please visit our website. We're also happy to take your calls via phone. There's also going to be a list of resources and contact details available in the chat. As with any virtual meeting, if you're experiencing problems with the internet connection and are booted off, simply rejoin the meeting and we'll let you back in. This session will be recorded for later viewing. So I'm now gonna pass it over to Dr. Kazmani to get started with a brief presentation. Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, you just... Great, can I confirm you can see my slides and you can hear me? Great, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Azim Kazmani, uh, as Lisa mentioned, and I am one of the Associate Medical Officers of Health here uh, in Niagara region and I'll be starting us off today. Uh, so this town hall is uh, really for the adults uh, and uh, who are associated with uh, children who are six months uh, to five years old. There's slide two, okay. So, you know, I think I wanna start off uh, and talk to you a little bit about the question everybody's going to be asking is, should I get my child vaccinated uh, for COVID-19? And this is a common question that we hear, and it's one that's worth asking. It's one that I've asked myself. It's one that our family uh, has asked. And I I'm hoping to go through things uh, with you and share with you a little bit maybe about what my family has been thinking about or has thought about, uh, as well as uh, answer some questions you may have. So I've asked myself that question. You know, COVID-19 is mild in kids. I'm worried about the side effects of vaccination. What are the side effects? How bad will they be? My child doesn't like needles. Um, and ultimately, I think we all want the same thing, which is to protect the health and safety of our children. Uh, so I'm hoping that I have the chance to uh, answer some of these questions and more through the presentation. And then again, go through some of the conversations that my family had when deciding whether or not to vaccinate our children against COVID-19. I think the best place to start uh, is what the current epidemiology is. So what's the risk right now? And as we all know, um, since the Omicron wave uh, in late November, December uh, 2021, not everyone had access to testing. So we can't look at case counts anymore. A lot of people are using rapid tests at home, which is good in some ways because it's much easier to test yourself uh, at home. But then those numbers don't all get counted and we're not really sure where exactly um, <clears throat> the risk is. So the one advantage we have is that we've realized that we can track our wastewater. So when, we, uh, when anyone's infected with COVID-19, um, part of that infection also infects the gut. Uh, and then when you poop, some COVID-19 virus uh, gets uh, excreted. And then we can look at our water treatment facilities and see how much COVID-19, the virus, that how much of the virus that causes COVID-19 is there. And generally the levels of virus there correlate uh, with the number of cases or the amount of the virus that's spreading in our community. So here, as we look at those levels, we can see, um, you, know, you, you have your initial levels uh, in December, January, they're quite high. That was the initial Omicron wave. Then we had a BA2 wave. Again, that went quite high. 
And now again, we're seeing another wave with what we think is most commonly driven by BA5, which is uh, <clears throat> the latest uh, variant that we've seen. And there's quite a high level of COVID-19 across Ontario. When we look specifically at our region, the Central West region, which is Niagara and a few more surrounding jurisdictions, we see that level is still going up. It's not quite as high as it was um, in January or in April, but it's still high and going uh, up right now. The other thing we know is that the people who are eligible for testing, um, <clears throat> almost one in five of them or about 20% of them are testing positive. That's incredibly high. Yesterday, when I looked, we had 21 outbreaks that were active uh, in our community in areas like long-term care homes or um, hospitals, uh, retirement homes, uh, and that number, I think, has gone up since then. So all that to say that there is a lot of COVID-19 circulating in our community right now, and there is some ongoing risk right now. Unfortunately, um, although there is a... Uh, uh, a sentiment out there, kids don't really get that sick. COVID-19 can still make children very sick. Uh, I can uh, go and I'll share with you some of those numbers now. Uh, anecdotally, I know friends who have had to take their children very recently to the hospital for COVID-19 illness, and the rates of hospitalization in children under five are quite significant. The other thing we know is that even children who don't get hospitalized can get sick. And even if it's a mild illness, even if it's a couple of days of fever or a couple of days of cough or, or things, we know how scary it can be to have a child who's sick. And to have a child who we find out has COVID-19 can be even scarier. Um, I can tell you when my kids are sick, uh, we lose a lot of sleep. My wife, uh, thankfully, <laughs> Uh, not thankfully for her, thankfully for me, uh, the kids always want her at night, so I get a bit more than she does, uh, but we're all very tired as a result. We can't go into work, um, you know, they can't go to school, or right now during the summer, they can't go to camp or to birthday parties, and it really affects our lives when we get sick. Um, and so if there's a tool out there that can help prevent us from getting sick, and if we do get sick to help keep it very mild, uh, it's definitely something uh, that we need to consider. And vaccination is that tool. When we look at our neighbors in, this, in the United States where they have uh, a lot more people, we look at their COVID-19 numbers there. What I really want to show you is that yellow line. So that's children in the age group that we are concerned about, the zero to four-year-olds. The other lines are for older children between five and 17 years old. Uh, and you can see that <clears throat> this is really the second highest level of um, hospitalizations for COVID-19 in that zero to four group we've seen since the initial Omicron wave uh, over uh, Christmas of 2021. So um, the rates are really high and they're far higher in this age group. And it looks like even though it's dipped a bit, it's trending upwards overall uh, and compared to the children in older age groups. So yes, in general, children don't have severe disease, but children in this age group of zero to four years old are actually uh, at higher risk than older children. Okay, that's great. Thanks for showing us the American numbers, but what's happening here in Ontario? This is as at the beginning of July, and so the numbers have uh, increased since then too, but over a thousand children under the age of five have been hospitalized for COVID-19 since the start. Uh, of the pandemic or even before it was declared the pandemic. And the zero to four year old age population has the highest number of hospitalizations amongst youth due to COVID-19 infection. Where we see there's a thousand there, less than about 250 for five to 11 and about 475 for ages 12 to 19. And so that picture, uh, it, that really paints a picture for us and that highlights the importance of vaccinating uh, those children under the age of five. Okay, great. So you've shown us the numbers for the whole pandemic. What about right now? This is the beginning of July. So the first two weeks of July, and we can look at the hospitalization rate for COVID-19 uh, amongst our children. And this also looks at the rate. So it's not just the number of kids, but if we have a ton of kids, maybe you know, some of those numbers would be more expected. But here we look for every 100,000 children, we're seeing about five of them hospitalized in that two week period. And that risk is higher than everyone 
up until the age of 60. And we know that COVID-19 can really affect people who are elderly, uh, 60 plus. So you see, really see the rate of hospitalization there. And again, this is a two week period just two weeks ago. So this is very recent uh, data and it really shows the impact and the risk to children uh, zero to four years old. Um, the other thing we know is uh, about effects like long COVID. Um, there's a condition called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children where infection with this virus can lead to inflammation of different organ systems. Even children with very mild disease or very mild courses of uh, COVID-19 illness can go on to develop some of these conditions, inflammation of these uh, different organ systems. And that can be really scary. Thankfully, um, what we've seen in adults, uh, especially with uh, things like long COVID, is that vaccination helps reduce the rates of long COVID. Uh, long COVID may be a similar process to this. Um, and uh, so we've also seen, thankfully, that these rates uh, are less common now than they were uh, in the past, or, or we, we think so based on some data. But overall, if we can protect ourselves, if we can protect our children from developing these cysts, from, from developing these types of symptoms or these types of conditions, um, that's the best step we can take to protect their health. Looking at COVID-19, uh, again, this is data from uh, the US, and this is looking at hospitalizations. So when we look at the rates of hospitalization in the US for COVID-19 for children six months to four years, during a one year period, it was 90 for every 100,000 children last year, uh, sorry, between April 2021 and March 2022, uh, who were hospitalized in the US for COVID-19. That's more than types of pneumonia, that's more than uh, chicken pox, and that's more than hepatitis A. In terms of deaths, uh, these are absolute numbers or the total numbers. 86 children have unfortunately died between January 2020 and May 2022 uh, because of COVID-19 in that age group. Uh, and we see that number is much higher than many of the other conditions that we vaccinate our children for, like rotavirus, like chicken pox, like rubella, like meningitis and hepatitis. And many of those have much bigger age ranges uh, and longer time periods too. And all of those numbers there are before there were vaccines. So once we had vaccines introduced for those, the rates plummeted. Uh, and we're hoping to see the same with COVID-19, that the rates of death, the rates of severe illness, the rates of our kids becoming sick uh, plummet. Uh, and this will be the best tool we have to prevent that. So we've gone through a little bit and talked about what the risks of COVID-19 are, what can happen as a result of our children getting COVID-19. But what about the vaccine? You know, can our children, if COVID-19, uh, let's say our child does have a mild course of COVID-19, we know there's a risk, but not every child will have a serious course. The majority will continue to have mild courses. But can your child get sicker from the vaccine? Will it affect my child's heart? And this is a question that I've asked myself before. You know, if I go to take my child vaccinated, will they get what we've heard about myocarditis and pericarditis? Even if they don't, what are the side effects and what types of things can happen as a result of getting the vaccine? So um, Moderna did a trial. They were 6,400 children, six months to five years old. And um, for every three children, for every four children in the trial, three of them would receive the vaccine, and one of them would receive the placebo. Um, I'll just note that Pfizer uh, is still undergoing review, so that has not yet been approved for this age group in Canada, although it has in the U.S. And this was a double-blind trial. Uh, there was a placebo-controlled, uh, and it was children in Canada and the U.S. And full disclosure, uh, two of these children in this trial were my children. Uh, so their information is included here. Uh, what the trial showed is that the efficacy or you know, how well the vaccine worked, um, and this was during a period of uh, Omicron. So uh, my children, for example, got vaccinated uh, or, or they, they got one of the two things in um, either placebo or vaccine in March. 
Um, and I think we recently just found out two or three weeks ago that they actually did receive vac the vaccine uh, and not placebo um, once it was approved uh, in the United States. So this is during the Omicron period. They found that the two-dose series of the Moderna vaccine was 51% effective against infection uh, in children two years of age uh, and under, and it was almost 40% effective in those who were two to five years old. Uh, and this was on par with what we've seen uh, in adults uh, during the Omicron wave. As well, they found that the immune response, so the number of antibodies that the uh, children in this age group created uh, were similar to those of uh, the number created by uh, the adolescent uh, group uh, when the testing was done uh, on them. So in terms of safety, uh, this is directly from uh, the FDA, um, the Federal Drug Administration in the United States. Uh, there were no deaths reported in any of the trial participants. So serious adverse events were very, very rare at less than 0.5% uh, of vaccine recipients and 0.2% of placebo recipients. So they also did occur amongst people who received a placebo. One individual, one um, member of the trial who received the vaccine had a febrile seizure um, and it was possibly related to the vaccine um, and that was the only uh, uh, that was the main serious adverse event that was reported no cases of the heart condition that we've heard of in older individuals like called myocarditis or pericarditis and no um, cases uh, of or no severe allergic reactions either so all that to say that the vaccine overall was very safe uh, and there weren't, uh, and, and besides that one event, there weren't any significant uh, serious adverse events. So if they're not serious adverse events, what are they? Um, the, it's very similar to other adult uh, and pediatric vaccines. And the side effects of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine for ages six months to five years were mild. <clears throat> Pardon me. They resolved within two to three days on their own. And maybe children would need some Tylenol or Advil during that time. The main one reported was pain at the site of infection. There were swollen lymph nodes. Um, there was fever, uh, some fatigue and headache in older children who can say that I have a headache or I have a fever, uh, and irritability or sleepiness in younger children. And I can tell you that uh, from my experience, you had to document every single day you had to report in what your child's temperature was, um, what you had to feel their lymph nodes, you had to check for all these sorts of things and report it every single day. And if you didn't, you got a call from the study telling you. And I can also tell you from our experience um, that the side effects were so mild and they were so minimal that we didn't know whether our children got placebo or whether they got the actual vaccine uh, when we were blinded. Uh, we had no way of knowing because the, the side effects were so mild. Um, so I think in general, just to summarize, uh, COVID-19 vaccines can help keep children healthy. They can help prevent and reduce the likelihood uh, of getting infected with uh, COVID-19. If our children do get infected with COVID-19 after they've been vaccinated, it helps reduce the likelihood of long COVID and other conditions. And it's really our best tool in fighting this virus during this pandemic, reducing the strain on our healthcare systems that are under significant pressure as it is, keeping our lives normal, keeping our kids in school, keeping them learning, protecting their mental health, keeping them at camp, letting them, making sure that they can keep seeing their friends. We have an added benefit that uh, when we are vaccinated, there's been studies that show that there's reduced transmission of COVID-19 to other people. We're infectious for shorter periods of time. And as a result of that, we'll be protecting uh, other children. We'll be protecting adults in our life as well, as well as those children who are under six months of age and who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. And again, you know, anyone with a child knows the challenge of having a sick kid, even for a couple of days. Uh, and parents of children, of young children, know how scary it is to have a sick child. Uh, and vaccination is one of the most effective ways to protect our families, our communities, uh, and ourselves against COVID-19. The evidence that we have so far to date shows 
that vaccines are very effective at preventing severe illness, hospitalizations, and death from COVID-19. Side effects are rare, uh, and the side effects we do see or, or, or after a vaccine are mild, and they go away on their own. Um, so a couple, I think there's a couple of common questions that we've been asked. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring them up here. And then I know there'll be another chance to ask some more. And Lisa will be asking some more. Um, you know, what if my child has recently had COVID-19? Um, many of us, as we saw in that chart, there's quite a bit of it circulating. Uh, and so many of us may uh, be in that boat right now. Uh, the recommendation for adults was always that wait three months. Uh, and I think the same principles apply uh, because then that gives, uh, it's similar to waiting between doses, gives your immune system a chance to see it again later and strengthen that immune response really. Of course, if you have the opportunity to vaccinate um, before infection, you reduce the risk significantly. Uh, and then even if you, you do get the infection, um, so it's always better to get vaccinated first. Um, I think we've all heard, or many of us have heard, that there'll be an updated COVID-19 vaccine that may be coming out in the fall. Um, oh, I think I heard, I saw somewhere yesterday that uh, some of that data has been submitted uh, to uh, Health Canada and the FDA in the United States. So should we wait for that updated vaccine for our kids? Will it be more like Omicron? Uh, will it provide better protection? Um, and that's a very good question. And I think some of the things we need to consider, are what's the current risk? So if we look at those charts I showed earlier, there is a risk of COVID-19 infection right now. We do see um, the risk to children of this age group being quite significant in terms of um, hospitalizations, for example, and other bad outcomes. Um, and the other thing is that we don't know so this new vaccine, the, the new composition of the vaccine will need to undergo review by Health Canada first. It will need to be approved first. And uh, I highly doubt that it will be available to children right away. Uh, so as we always say, you know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. There's a risk right now. There's a low risk to it. Uh, my recommendation would be to get the vaccine now rather than to wait for something that may or may not come out uh, in the future. Um, we've had some questions uh, about why did it take so long for a vaccine to be available for children. Uh, and I really think that much of this has to do with uh, the testing that's needed to approve a vaccine for children. Um, you know, uh, children are precious. We can't have anything uh, really, um, we, we don't want to take any risks at all. So they have to be really rigorously tested. And from what I understand, the FDA in the United States asked the companies to go back and collect additional data as well. Uh, and so that's why you know, we were initially expecting these vaccines in February, and it got pushed back because the regulators wanted more data, more information to ensure these vaccines were safe uh, before they were satisfied. And once they received all that, then they uh, allowed um, the, the process uh, to move forward. Um, and then there was a question about, can my child receive this vaccine with their other shots? You know, our children, especially the younger ones, are going in regularly. The recommendation is to wait two weeks between uh, COVID-19 vaccine and other vaccines. Main reason for that is that uh, if you do get a side effect, um, you know, like the fevers, like the pain, et cetera, uh, you, we can better document which vaccine uh, caused it um, and, and not have uh, anything misattributed uh, to these COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so happy to answer your questions. Um, we have a, a few more coming, I'm sure. Again, overall, my recommendation would be to vaccinate your children. Uh, and I say that coming as somebody who wouldn't recommend anything I wouldn't recommend for my own family. Uh, and I say based on my experience uh, as well, that uh, vaccination, um, I, I would recommend it based on my experience. I was listening to uh, Dr. Paul Offit, who's a pediatrician in Philadelphia at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's also a member of the Independent um, Vaccine Committee for the FDA, the Vaccines and Related Biological Products, uh, yada yada committee. Um, and he said that uh, he's still being, a, he's still seeing children admitted with COVID-19 um, and that the vaccine provides excellent protection against hospitalization, against long COVID, against MISC. He was the one who said that, uh, you know, even children who had not had significant illness could go on to develop MISC, um, but 
uh, the vaccination could help protect against that. And that the risks of vaccination are extremely low, but the risks of COVID-19 infection are there. Uh, so taking this step to protect our children uh, from COVID-19 uh, is highly recommended. So that wraps up uh, the brief presentation uh, I was going to give. I'll turn it over to Dr. Herji now, uh, who has a little bit more information on how you get your child vaccinated, the process, uh, and uh, more. Right. Thank you, Dr. Kazmani. And, uh, you know, as a parent who actually had to make this decision, I think you've explained the uh, thoughts around it far better than I could ever do. So as you noted, I'm going to quickly just walk us through some of the details and logistics about actually going about and getting that vaccine. So, you know, if you've hopefully decided to make that vaccine or you make that decision in the coming days after perhaps talking with the rest of your family and maybe even your child, what are the different options you have for where you can go to get your child vaccinated? And there's really three options available for you. The first one, and the one that's going to be available, I think, to most people right off the bat, is to actually come to one of the clinics that we are going to be hosting in public health. Starting this Thursday, you'll be able to book a vaccine appointment on Thursday morning, and actually middle of the day Thursday, we're actually going to be able to start delivering that vaccine to children. We think many parents are actually going to want to get their vaccine through their primary care provider. Your primary care provider is probably the one giving vaccines to your child for all of their other uh, uh, required vaccinations to prevent all those other infections. And so they're the one who knows your child best, their child is comfortable with them, and that's going to probably be an option. They're not uh, set up with vaccine quite yet. We're hoping in the next week or two, they'll start to be able to receive vaccine. Please do reach out to your primary care provider if you're interested in that option to make sure they're aware that you're interested so they can let you know as soon as that option is available. And one other option out there is gonna be, there will be some pharmacies that sign up to deliver this vaccine as well. Again, it doesn't sound like they're gonna be set up this week, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks, they'll be available and that'll be another option available for anybody who does wanna get that. Right now though, if you're really most keen to get your vaccine, it's gonna be in public health clinics starting this Thursday that you can get that vaccine. And we're gonna have actually a few different clinics. So, you know, we're gonna run clinics Tuesdays through Saturdays every week. And those clinics are gonna run from 9.30 to 3.45. And we're gonna have a few different locations where you can go for your vaccine. So we'll have the Canada One Outlet Mall in Niagara Falls. We have a clinic set up there. It's right by the Urban Kids. We have a small clinic at the Penn Center in St. Catharines. We're periodically, not every day, but once in a while, gonna be at the Port Coburn Visitor Information Center so we can make sure we have some clinics for our friends in South Niagara. And we're actually gonna be offering vaccines to a couple of our public health offices, our office in Thorold and our office in Welland. And what's really nice about those two locations is that they're actually dedicated clinic rooms. So there'll be a little bit more privacy if you're worried your child might uh, you know, be disturbed by some of the commotion that might be going on in a larger clinic, in these clinics, they'll be in a room all by themselves along with you and the nurse vaccinating, and they'll be a, maybe a bit more of a controlled environment. And for some parents, that might be quite appealing. And we're gonna be having several of those clinics as well on most days as well on the week. If you wanna book the vaccine, uh, it's gonna be done the way it's been done for past public health clinics, where we're gonna be on the Ontario vaccine booking tool. So this website here, ontario.ca slash book vaccine is where you go. Starting Thursday morning, children zero, six months to four years of age will be able to vaccinate. And you just need to go there, sign them up. You will need to include information about your child's health card number. So please have your health card on hand when you go to sign them up to make sure you're able to fill in all those details. If for some reason your child does not have a health card, not to worry, you can still actually vaccinate them. It's just gonna be a slightly different process. And that'll actually involve calling the provincial vaccine booking line. And anybody who doesn't wanna use that online portal is welcome to call that line as well to book your vaccine. Or if you have any issues with that vaccine portal online, you can call them up. I suspect most parents are pretty tech savvy these days and will like the website option, but this is absolutely another option available for you to go do that. And then if you are attending one of our public health vaccine clinics, I'm just gonna quickly walk you through what you can expect that experience is gonna be like. So first thing when you arrive at that clinic is you'll be met by one or two people there who are just gonna make sure that you're healthy, you don't have any symptoms of illness, your child doesn't have any symptoms of illness, because we wanna make sure that people who are coming to get their child protected 
I'm going to be around perhaps someone who might be a little bit ill and potentially spread infection. We're also, you know, as Dr. Kazmani talked about, very mindful that we are seeing a higher level of COVID spreading right now. And so we are going to expect everybody to be wearing masks. And if you don't have a mask with you, we'll be able to provide you one at that point as well. Once you're past that initial point, and of course your child and you don't have any symptoms and you've got your mask, you'll head over to a check-in desk. And this is a desk where we're gonna look up your appointment, confirm that you're the right person, you're at the right location, and make sure we have all of your, your information so you're ready to go to get your vaccine. Next up, you might have to line up for a couple seconds. Maybe you're lucky and there's no lineup. And what you're gonna see is there'll be several different nurses at different vaccine stations. And they're gonna hold up one of these green check mark signs when they're ready for a new person. There'll be a staff person on hand to kind of direct you and send you off to that nurse if you don't see their uh, sign up. And basically you go over to them, you both take a seat. The nurse is gonna take a moment probably to say hi to your child, calm them down, give them a little toy so they can be relaxed and distracted a little bit. And then we'll go into a conversation about what the vaccine entails, give the information on it, give you an opportunity to answer and ask any questions you have and give you answers so that you're ready to move forward with that vaccination. If you've been to one of our vaccine clinics as an adult, you've probably seen it's a relatively quick appointment. For children, we recognize that you may have more questions and we also don't wanna rush children through this process. So it's actually a longer appointment time. It's twice as long that we provide for children to go through that vaccine appointment to just to make sure that they're really comfortable that US parents really have the opportunity to ask questions. We, of course, have a larger vaccine station as well because we want to have room for both you and your child to be able to sit together and you to be able to help uh, comfort and coach them through that experience. And our goal is, of course, to be like this situation where after the child gets the vaccine, they're really pleased and had a really great experience. And we're really going to endeavor to try and provide that. You can probably see at the back here, we've got some, you know, colored twist uh, ties and other things. Uh, after that injection, we're going to have some fun bandages for your child to put on to really try and make it as fun of an experience as possible for them. And if we notice your child is anxious or anything, our nurses are trained in some special research-based techniques of how we calm children down and really make this the most positive experience for them possible. After vac being vaccinated, your child will actually get to go over to a table and pick out a small treat as recognition of the real bravery that they've shown here. This is from our vaccine clinics earlier in the year when we're vaccinating older children. And right at this clinic, we had some books and there'll be some books or toys available for your child as well. You'll also notice these little uh, bits of cardboard here, which are actually little kind of picture frame signs that your child can use to take a picture of themselves after getting vaccinated. Just like these two children here did in one of our past clinics where they you know, get the highlight that they stuck it to COVID-19 and that they're a real superhero helping us fight COVID-19. I also just really love this child's uh, uh, shirt there, what he has written there. And then the last part of the vaccine experience is gonna be heading over to our waiting area. We ask that you wait in the clinic for about 15 minutes after the vaccine appointment, just to make sure that there's no issues and everybody's feeling well before they leave. If you do sit down and anything feels amiss, please just flag one of our staff. They'll be happy to come over, check things out and make sure everybody's okay and help you make sure that your child is feeling well before they leave the appointment. We of course have two seats there you saw because we of course want both you and the child you come with to be very relaxed and have a chance to spend that time together. And so that's basically the flow here. You know, we check if you have any symptoms, get your mask, check in, you go to the vaccine station, pick up your treat, maybe take that photo, wait around a little bit, and then finally check out. And if you go to one of our public health offices in Thorold or Welland, the only difference is that that vaccine station is going to be a private room where there's a little bit more privacy and you're a little bit more shielded from everything else that's going on. But otherwise, it's going to be the exact same process. If after today, we hope we'll answer all your questions, but if you do have more questions, there are a few options for where you can get more information. And the first one is to visit our website here, nigaregion.ca slash COVID-19. If you visit that website, you'll come up to a page looking a little bit like this. And just a few things I'm gonna quickly highlight for you is, first off, right up here, we have a quick link to information about vaccination. So you can go there and from there, you can actually find the website to book your vaccine if that's what you want to do, as well as see our vaccine clinic schedule. 
We've got the phone number if you need to call the provincial hotline to book your vaccine appointment as well. And then we have a link down here with information about the vaccine. So you can hopefully explore a little bit more, see more of the frequently asked questions and hopefully resolve any lingering questions you might have. Just clicking through that there, this is the kind of page that will show up. And I just wanna highlight along the left-hand side here, all of the different other parts of that website that we have. So information on where you to get your vaccine, we have a dedicated page for children and youth, frequently asked questions, some of our vaccine statistics, et cetera. So lots of information available for hopefully to answer your question. And if I'll just highlight quickly here, if you click on the where to get vaccinated, you'll come to this page, which of course has information on our vaccine clinics. Up top here, you'll see we have information where you can get that link to book your vaccine or call that provincial number to book your vaccine. We have some information on the other places where you can go to get vaccinated, including a link to some of the pharmacies doing vaccinations, walking clinics that might be doing vaccinations. Just noting that this is all COVID vaccines, so it's not necessarily going to be vaccines available for zero, yeah, six month year olds to four year olds. So just be sure to call ahead to make sure they're doing vaccines for your child's age group. And then I mentioned earlier, if you don't have a health card, you can absolutely still book a vaccine clinic. We just ask that you click this link, fill out some electronic information in a form for us, and then call that provincial hotline to book your appointment. Aside from our website, a few other places to get information, and perhaps first off, the, mo the most useful to you might be to actually talk to your primary care provider. Again, they know you well, they know your child well, and they'll hopefully be able to really answer any in-depth questions that you have about your vaccine. Even if they're not doing the vaccinations themselves, they'll hopefully be able to provide any answers that you need. You can, of course, call that vaccine contact center at the provincial, uh, uh, at the province as well, where they can book vaccines, but they actually have people available to answer some of your questions as well. Uh, perhaps not in the next couple of weeks, because we expect to be busy with all the parents bringing their children forward for vaccines, but you can always stop by at one of our vaccine clinics and ask to speak to with a nurse. There's absolutely no obligation to get vaccinated. You can just sit down, have a conversation with the nurse, discuss some of the questions and thoughts on your mind, get that information and then leave and think a little bit more about what choice you want to ultimately make for your child. And then finally, we do still have our COVID-19 info line here at Public Health, which you can call and get some answers as well. Most of the people answering those questions are not going to be healthcare providers like nurses, so they're not necessarily going to provide the same kind of in-depth information, for example, your primary care provider can do, but they're really great if you have any kind of logistic questions around booking your vaccine appointment and the like. Finally, I just want to highlight some of the examples of past children and parents who've gone through our vaccine clinics to vaccinate their children and the really positive experience we made it for them and hopefully we're gonna make it for your child as well if you choose to get vaccinated. We have a parent here really highlighting how the children were a bit nervous but also brave and excited and they thought that we made it a really easy experience for them to get vaccinated. You can see both of them very cutely, they're posing for photos after getting their vaccine. Uh, this individual here, giving us applause for the awesome clinic that we read in terrific kid-friendly vaccine clinic. His daughter got to stick it to COVID with that vaccine, but also scored a book, some art supplies, and a really cute butterfly ring here. And of course, had a really positive experience as well. This individual giving us kudos for a well-organized and kid-friendly clinic as well. You can see here this young child here, you know, uh, what a special day, um, exceptionally well done in terms of uh, the kind of caliber of clinic that we provided again. Um, this parent here, you know, thanking us for the fantastic job at our clinic and it sounds like her child was a little bit nervous, but fortunately we were able to help her through that experience and make it a really positive one for her. And just a few more here. This mom, of course, very grateful and her cute kids are here posing for their photos after getting their vaccine. This individual here, a loss for words of how emotionally positive the experience was, beyond amazing how our staff made the experience that much easier for them to go through that vaccine appointment. Uh, this parent, you know, thanking us for making a fun and positive experience for her children and showing one of their children there with their, uh, after getting vaccinated with a real smile on their face. And then here, another parent showing, you know, a couple of their children getting their photos after the vaccine and felt that their children were well informed prior to coming and all of the staff on hand were really amazing. 
And that's really the experience that we hope to provide all of your children if you choose to come to our clinic and get vaccinated. We really believe the vaccine is the best thing we can do to make sure our children are gonna be safe and healthy, especially as we head into the fall. They perhaps head to preschool or childcare or maybe even are starting kindergarten this year. We wanna make sure they're safe and healthy that they have a great experience going through their learning and they don't have to deal with any of their really negative effects of being sick and especially not of being hospitalized. And we hope you'll make the choice to get vaccinated and hope we'll be able to answer questions over the next 30 minutes or so to hopefully address that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa who will take over and uh, start to moderate some of the questions. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a mother myself, and so I know sometimes when you're making vaccination decisions about your children, there's a lot of information to process. You have specific questions on your mind. So some of these questions I'm gonna say, some of them have been addressed, but maybe you were processing something else, and also maybe something that the doctors want to elaborate on now that they see it as a question. So. Um, for some, there might be some repetition with some of these questions, but I think it's really valuable to go over it from both of those perspectives. So the first question I have is for Dr. Hershey. Uh, I know we can begin booking on Thursday, but when do the actual appointments start at the clinic? Can we go this week? Absolutely, we can go this week. And actually our first appointments to uh, actually vaccinate these young children are gonna start on Thursday at 1 p.m. So that morning, you'll be able to go log in and book your children for a vaccine appointment. And if you're lucky and get one of those first few, you could be there at 1 p.m. And then we're going to have clinics every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday going forward, including the Saturday this long weekend. The second question I'm going to pass to Dr. Kazmani. How much time should be between the COVID-19 shot and the routine vaccines? Yeah, that's a, a good question and an important one. Uh, and one uh, many of us have been asking. Um, it's two weeks uh, between the regular vaccines or, or their um, their scheduled vaccines uh, and other uh, in the COVID-19 vaccine. So on either end, two weeks. So this next question is also for you as well. And I know I actually had a friend ask me this this weekend. So the question is, what is the dose difference between the vaccine for six months to five years and the vaccine for the five years to the 11 years? So the context is this parent guardian has a child that will be turning five in just over a month, and they're trying to decide if they should wait a month for the higher dose. So that's a really good question. And um, there's a couple of things there to go into. So one, um, the... Um, the, the product for, from Moderna is actually authorized for children uh, who are six months to six years old. Uh, the Moderna product is 25 micrograms um, of active uh, mRNA. Um, and the product actually for five to 11 year olds is 10 micrograms. And that one's from Pfizer. Now we have to remember that there are some differences in the makeup uh, in the way in some of the proprietary materials that are used to help deliver. Uh, and so the dose alone uh, isn't uh, telling the whole picture, but in general, that Moderna dose actually has a bit more of the mRNA than the Pfizer one. Okay. So this question, I'm gonna go back to Dr. Hershey. Wondering if I was vaccinated while pregnant with this child, if they'll have enough immunity or should they get the vaccine? And the second part to that is, will children receive several doses? Yeah, so really uh, great decision you've made as a parent if you made sure to get vaccinated while you're pregnant. Pregnant uh, persons are unfortunately at higher risk of complications from COVID infection. So having that protection of vaccine is really useful. One of the things that happens when you have immunity as a parent is that some of your antibodies get passed over to your child. So when your child is born, they have some of those antibodies from you protecting them. So if you got vaccinated against COVID-19, your child got some of those antibodies. So your child in their first few months of life is protected with those antibodies. Unfortunately, those antibodies don't last forever. They only last a few months. 
And once those antibodies are gone, your child no longer has any immunity or any protection. So we need to start vaccinating them so that they can build up and train their immune system to produce those antibodies themselves and make sure they're protected. So, you know, great decision that vaccine you got is a, uh, while you're pregnant is gonna protect your child through those first six months of life. And once they hit six months of age, you need to start vaccinating them so they can start to protect themselves going forward from that point onwards. And Dr. Herji, do children receive several doses? Yes, the Moderna vaccine is a two dose vaccine. You'll need to get two doses, their child, sorry, will need to get two doses of the vaccine. And we recommend those two doses are eight weeks apart. That minimizes the mild side effects of the vaccine, but also actually maximizes how strong the immunity the child gets. Great. Just to add to that quickly, down the line, um, you know, six months, eight months, 12 months from now, we may find out that an additional dose would be beneficial as well. Um, but for now, it's a two-dose vaccine. I know many people think about the Pfizer vaccine, and in the U.S., the Pfizer vaccine's also been approved for children this age, uh, but that is actually a three-dose vaccine. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to Dr. Herji. There's, this parent has asked two questions, so I'll start with the first one and then follow up with the second. So this question is, is it safe to get an autistic child vaccinated? And how can we help the child go through the vaccination process without traumatizing them so as they can't communicate? Yeah, so absolutely safe for your autistic child to get vaccinated, and we strongly recommend it. Um, if your you know, child uh, got sick with COVID-19, I'm sure it'd be a very difficult experience for them. If unfortunately they were one of those who got hospitalized, I think that would be extremely traumatic. So we absolutely do recommend you get them vaccinated and make sure they have that protection. In terms of how to help them get through that vaccine process, you know, the first thing I think we would really wanna do is talk to you as a parent to really understand you know, what keeps them calm? How can we make it the most comfortable experience for them and really rely on your experience and your expertise of knowing your own child. And we're really gonna do whatever it takes then to accommodate them to that appointment. Some of the things that our nurses definitely do just generally for children is that we have toys and uh, tools to try and keep them distracted. So they're focused on something much more fun and positive and not necessarily thinking about that needle that's gonna be injected in them. We have ways to actually calm them down in ways and relax their muscles. And when we do that, it actually means that injection hurts a lot less. So that hopefully is gonna make it a more positive experience for them as well. We also try and actually talk to the child and really engage with them and make them give them some control of the experience to give them some choices over how the experience goes because when they have that control and choice over things it often seems to help them as well so those are some of the things we'll do but really going to look hopefully to any guidance you can provide us on how to make it easiest for them great and also in follow-up another question this parent guardian was asking is Will this be required um, mandatory for their child to go to school in September or is it still optional? It's ultimately going to be a decision by the provincial government if they decide to make it a requirement to go for school, but all indications are it's not going to be a requirement. It's purely going to be an option. Obviously, it's an option we strongly encourage you to take so that your child can be safe and healthy as they go through school, especially when they're on lots of others. But we don't see any reason to think it's not going to be a choice that you can make one way or the other. So now I'm going to go back to Dr. Kazmani. How long after a known exposure to COVID should we wait? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I did answer it typing in, and then I realized I forgot one thing. Uh, so in general, if it's an exposure, if it's a recent exposure, you should wait 10 days uh, to make sure that your child doesn't develop COVID-19, um, at least 10 days. And if they do develop COVID-19, then you'll want to uh, wait. Um, if they're infected, you should wait uh, about three months, 90 days, similar to what we suggest for adults, though you don't have to. There may be other situations. There may be something more in your specific circumstance where you choose to get your child vaccinated sooner. Um, and if they were, let's say, exposed, there was another child at their camp who had COVID-19, but they didn't go on to develop it. And this was a month ago. There's no need to wait uh, to get them vaccinated. So next, I'm going to go back to Dr. Herji. Why did it take Health Canada so long to approve the vaccine for this age group? Can you talk about what measures were taken to approve the vaccine for this age group? 
Yeah, so the reason it took a while is because everybody takes the safety of children extremely seriously. And nobody wanted to rush that process and they wanted to make sure that this vaccine was studied extremely carefully to be absolutely certain it was very safe and is gonna be effective for children when they started to get it. Um, one of the things that actually happened when uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies developing the Moderna vaccine first put forward the application, there's actually a request that went back to them to actually get some additional information so that they could do a deeper dive to confirm all of that. So the biggest reason actually was a lot of the rigor that went behind ensuring the safety of this and effectiveness of this vaccine and making sure all of that due diligence was done going forward. The other part about the vaccine, of course, is that the way we do vaccine approvals is we start off approving a vaccine for adults and then we slowly move down to younger and younger ages. And so of course, this is the age group that is the youngest. So they were the last age group in that chain of vaccine approvals. And so unfortunately for parents who have children in that age group, they had to wait the longest to have a vaccine approved. But it also meant that the vaccine has been used in all the populations older than this. And so we've seen literally tens of millions of children and tens of millions of adults vaccinated against COVID-19 seen how well those vaccines are and seen how safe they are in those age groups to give us even more confidence that it's gonna be safe in this younger age group. Thank you, Dr. Hershey. I'm also gonna ask you one more question before I move on to Dr. Kazmani. Why was Pfizer the only vaccine recommended for my 13 year old, but now only Moderna is recommended for my four year old? Why should I trust this for my youngest and not my older child? Yeah, so actually both Moderna and Pfizer were recommended for all children six years and up as well as all teens, adults. Both vaccines have actually been recommended for all of those age groups. That being said, there was a slight preference given to Pfizer for children and adolescents as well as people in their 20s and then a preference for Moderna in people who are age 30 and over. And that really had to do when we saw the real world performance of the vaccine. We saw that Moderna actually gave a bit slightly stronger immunity for older adults. And so therefore it became the slightly preferred vaccine, though of course both of them provided excellent protection and both were very safe. We also saw that for people in their 20s, that uh, side effect of heart inflammation called myocarditis, which is very mild in most people, was slightly more common with Moderna. Didn't seem to be more common in older age groups and it doesn't really seem to be necessarily more common for children, but it was for people age 20. But because we didn't see that benefit as well, we decided that for most children, it would make sense to preferably use Pfizer whenever we had it rather than Moderna, just to be on the safe side that we weren't giving that slight increased risk of the side effect, while of course still giving the equal protection. What we stand right now for children who are six months to four years of age is that there's no Pfizer vaccine approved because the Pfizer vaccine actually in the clinical trials didn't perform very well. And so Pfizer had to go back and they're making some adjustments to what they're seeking for approval. Meanwhile, Moderna's vaccine actually performed really well and was also really safe. So they were able to actually go through, get their approval. And so they have a licensed vaccine, which is safe and effective now for all age groups, whereas Pfizer only has it for age five and up. And so because, of course, we don't have both a Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, there's, of course, no preference to choose. We only have one vaccine, and it's a safe and effective vaccine, and so it's absolutely recommended. Um, but uh, that's, you know, really the reason why we're recommending Moderna right now, because it's the vaccine that we have to provide children protection. And as noted, you know, by Dr. Pesmani earlier, we are seeing high levels of COVID-19 right now. You know, we're only a couple months away from children going to preschool or to maybe starting kindergarten. And there's an opportunity now to do those two doses in eight weeks to make sure they have that protection before they go back to school. And actually, that's a great lead into the next question for Dr. Kazmani. For children recently infected, would it be more advantageous to wait the full three months or do it before school starts? They have a child uh, starting JK for the first time. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, the answer is really it depends. It depends how recently they were infected. Uh, you know, if it was very recently, it may be better to wait, get them their first dose just before they start school and then get them their second dose eight weeks later. Depends on their, you know, do they have any other medical conditions? Um, are they otherwise healthy? And there may be certain situations where it is better to get it done, get the first dose now, you know, uh, and then the second one just before they start school. If they were, uh, if they had COVID in December, 
uh, during the big Omicron wave or in even in April um, during the, the second Omicron wave, then it may be then it would be fine to get it now. Uh, so it depends on a bunch of variables. Uh, as always, uh, talking to your family doctor, your healthcare provider is a great first step uh, to determine uh, what's best for you. Uh, as well, uh, you can always uh, call into our team and, and find out. Uh, but it depends on some of those things. It's very recent. It may be better to wait unless there's other reasons. Um, and of course, if you want to have that peace of mind, get it sooner. Uh, that's always an option. And you're always welcome to, uh, to book an appointment for your child. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Dr. Hershey for this question. This parent guardian says, I was vaccinated while pregnant and I just got the booster. I am still breastfeeding. Is my child receiving antibodies again? That's a really good question. I'm going to look to Dr. Kasmani if he's read anything about this. I haven't read anything about the antibodies through breast milk specifically for COVID-19. Looks like Dr. Kasmani might have a more accurate answer. Um, I think there is some transfer of uh, maternal antibodies, um, but again, those are transient. Uh, and so they, uh, you know, ones we make ourselves uh, through our natural immunity, whether that's through a vaccine or through infection, they can stay with us a lot longer. Uh, and they're, I think, more, it's, immunology is very complicated. I still remember my third year immunology course is uh, being very challenging. We don't completely understand the immune system, but there's B cells, there's T cells, and there's more long lasting immunity that we get from that vaccine than we get from that passive uh, immunity provided by breast milk. So certainly breast milk can help, or as far as we know, uh, but, um, it doesn't provide that long lasting immunity, which the vaccine would provide. Yeah. And the other thing I'll add is that, of course, when they did the clinical trials, they saw those young children were better protected against COVID-19 if they're vaccinated versus not vaccinated. There's probably a mix of some parents who are breastfeeding versus some who are not there, but it still seems to imply that even the children who are getting breastfed, they were still better protected when they were vaccinated. Okay, I'm looking at the time now. We have time for one last question. And I'm gonna stay with you, Dr. Kazmani. Uh, are copies of Health Canada's clinical trials accessible to parents? Uh, so again, another very good question. Um, the clinical trials themselves are put on by the company, by Moderna, by Pfizer, by whatever company uh, is making uh, the drug, in this case, uh, Moderna. They were sent to Health Canada uh, for review. Um, and uh, so Health Canada then reviewed them in detail. Uh, and uh, actually, as uh, Dr. Herji mentioned, uh, the FDA in the US uh, in Health Canada here went back to the companies and asked them for more information. Uh, so at this time, um, then what happens is that the companies publish their trials in a journal like the New England Medical Journal uh, or something like that. And once it's published there, then it becomes available to the public uh, to see. I don't know, Dr. Herji, did you want to? No, I think you've provided everything. We've got, you know, a lot of the results already through Health Canada submissions that they've required to be made public. Uh, in the U.S., the FDA has made a lot of that detail public. Is actually quite a lot of detail on that you can find through the U.S. Um, and as well, National Advisory Committee on Immunization. When they made the recommendation, they really summarized all of the data on both effectiveness and safety of the vaccine. There will be the publication by Moderna, which will go into a little bit more detail perhaps, but there's lots of information out there already. And just to add, it's been reviewed in the US and approved there by the Federal Drug Administration. There's an independent committee that made a recommendation to the Federal Drug Administration. And then again, it was reviewed by their, uh, their immunization practice committee, who then recommended that to the CDC. The CDC then independently reviewed it and also approved it. So they were uh, multiple bodies and in Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada. So it looks like we have three minutes left. I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Hershey, Dr. Kazmani, is there any sort of final takeaways that you wanted to leave with everyone for tonight? Yeah, I think just from our perspective, you know, we had a good experience getting our children vaccinated. We asked many of the same questions went back and forth initially because we were part of the trial as well and we didn't know the side effects. Very glad we did now seeing the side effect profile, seeing how well our children tolerated it. It was even better than some of the other routine uh, immunizations they receive. 
Um, and I'm very glad that they had that protection, especially during the Omicron wave, especially uh, as they go back to daycare, to school. And it's really allowed us to be a bit more getting back to normal and feeling like we can do things because our children have that added layer of protection. Yeah, I think Dr. Kazmani has really said it best. And I'm actually just going to maybe highlight a couple of things that he presented earlier. You know, first off, unfortunately, the pandemic isn't over and COVID-19 is still with us. We're going through another wave. And I think many of us are quite concerned that when we get into the fall, we move indoors, uh, everybody goes back to school and work. It's going to create conditions where there could be yet another wave. And we, of course, don't want to see any children getting sick or being hospitalized during that period. Unfortunately, when we look at the data around hospitalizations, it is higher for children in that zero to four age group than it is for children who are five years and up. And so this is a higher risk group of children. And so we absolutely wanna make sure they have that protection before we start to see what goes on in the fall. And then, you know, Dr. Kazmani showed some of the data around hospitalizations and even deaths for children zero to four from COVID-19 as compared to what we see for other vaccines. And this disease, COVID-19, is more dangerous and more deadly than a lot of the other diseases that we vaccinate for. And just like we want to make sure our children are protected from all of those other infections, we absolutely, I think, want to make sure that our children are protected from COVID-19 as well. I just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to come out tonight. We hope your questions were were answered. Uh, this recording will be on our website in the near future. And we're also going to try and keep up to date with information and any sort of questions that we keep hearing from parents and guardians. Thanks so much and take care.